Well, good morning and welcome to our Monday Bible study. It's been several weeks since we've been together, and I appreciate all of y'all returning back in person and online. Um, next week we will be out for the holiday, but then we'll come back and continue through Mark. Uh, we're over halfway through Mark. We ended in chapter 8 last time. We begin in chapter 9 today. And last week we ended with Jesus's um, asking his disciples, who do they think that I am? They've said you are the Messiah. Peter does. Jesus tells them about what he must undergo. The Son of Man must undergo great suffering. Peter chastises him. Then Jesus talks about what it means to be a follower of of Jesus, about the cost of following Jesus. Um, And we pick up in chapter 9, verse 2, six days later. So I can only imagine what those six days would have been like, but you can imagine Peter probably not saying a whole lot. I would imagine that. You know, Jesus says that he is the Messiah. You said true, what you said is true, but uh, this is what the Messiah must do. And the cost of following Jesus, uh, Jesus says, is to pick up your cross, and those who save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake, for the sake of the gospel, will save it. Um, And he says, if you are ashamed of me and my words in this sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed. So we can just imagine for six days there's been kind of a, a lull all that anticipation that's happened that we've seen throughout the the narrative of Mark, of of all Jesus has been doing, all the disciples have seen, and now he's saying, yes, I am the Messiah, but these are the things that are going to happen. So six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John. So these are kind of the inner circle of the twelve, who are a, uh, the twelve are part of the larger group of disciples who have been following Jesus. And they go up a high mountain apart by themselves. So Jesus and his disciples are moving up a mountain. And if we go back to our Old Testament imagery, mountains are always places where God shows up whether it is Mount Sinai, whether it is other places. So Jesus takes this inner circle up a mountain, and as they are up there, he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, so as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Now just imagine you are Peter and John and James. You've had that week after Jesus has essentially said what's going to happen. And I'm guessing if I was Peter, James, or John, I would have probably been a little frustrated and probably some questions. You know, is Jesus really the Messiah if this is what he thinks is going to happen? My expectations of Jesus were this. Now they're this. And then all of a sudden you go up on a mountain And there, lo and behold, Jesus changes right in front of you. He becomes like Moses when he comes down the mountain and he's he's shining. He's glowing. He's so bright. His clothes become so bright. It is, is brighter than anything that bleach could have done to them. And they're looking and they see not only there, but they see Elijah and Moses talking with Jesus. If you had to pick two people, the most important people uh, of the Old Testament, the people that they looked up to, Moses and Elijah are up there. And what did Moses do? Moses led the people from what? Bondage to freedom. What did Elijah do? Elijah was God's prophet who spoke to what? People in power who did miracles... And what happened to him? He was taken up. In the day of Jesus, when people thought about what would it be like when God shows up in the world, if you read some of the intertestamental writings, many of them have this idea is that Elijah is going to come back and call the people to repentance. And what has John the Baptist and Jesus been doing? Calling the people to repentance. There's this idea when God shows up in the world that God will send a messenger ahead of them. 
And here Moses and Elijah, the one who helped give the law and the one who helped the people turn back to the law, are standing on the mountain talking with Jesus. Now can you imagine you're Peter, James, and John? Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, teacher, um, Matthew's gospel and Luke's gospel will use more of the word Lord for Jesus, kind of a, a, a sign of Jesus as the master over the group, uh, the one that teaches. Mark uses the term rabbi, but the term rabbi isn't just teacher, but it is a sign of an important person. Rabbi. Lord. It is good for us to be here. Most of us would probably say something similar. It is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. They essentially want to make Three places to memorialize what is going on here, uh, to house kind of a, a, a place of, of worship and a place of honor uh, for all of them. Um, it would have been um, something that would have been a marker for what God is doing there in that place. And if we had been there, we'd want to stay up there too, wouldn't we? I mean, how many of y'all remember a, a mountain high experience in your life? Yeah, y'all remember those mountain high experiences. It's hard to come back down, ain't it? You'd rather just stay up there. This is, for them, this is it. This is the pinnacle of where they've been. And notice where it happens within the gospel narrative. It happens right in the center of Mark's gospel after Jesus' profession of who He is and what's going to happen. And on the way to... From here onward, down the mountain will be the cross. And Jesus already alluded to it. So for Peter, James, and John, it would make sense. They just want to stay there. Let's just stay there. This is a good place to be. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. So that image of a cloud comes back from the Old Testament imagery of God in the cloud. If you go back to the story of Moses on the mountain, where does God speak from? Yeah. And what does, um, what does the voice say? This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. In Mark's Gospel, when have we heard another voice like this before? In baptism. So one of the interesting things that Mark does for us is he breaks up the gospel in different stages. The first stage, you hear the voice of saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus goes to this temptation and then starts the ministry of repentance in the kingdom of God. And all the wonderful things happen. Here, the middle of the gospel, Jesus is on the mountain with his disciples and he hears the same voice. And when Jesus leaves the mountain onward, he's headed towards Jerusalem, the cross. In both Jesus' ministry and Jesus' journey to the cross is both a calling of God and also a, a sign of God's belovedness of who he is in his ministry and mission. Every time the voice of God comes to Jesus and comes to his disciples, it leads Jesus what? To move forward. <clears throat> Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore but only Jesus. So this wonderful vision happens in front of them where they see beyond the curtain and they see Jesus' identity in a new way. They see Elijah and Moses. They hear the voice of God. And then all of a sudden, just as it happened, it's gone. And they just see Jesus. 
Most of us, have y'all ever had like an epiphany moment with, with God? I have those sometimes. And you feel close to God and it feels just wonderful and then it's gone. Y'all ever have those? It's like a dream that you wake up from. It's hard to hold on to. You can imagine how Peter and James and John, after experiencing this moment with Jesus, and then it's gone. And they got to do what? They got to go back down the mountain. I always think about what it would have been like for Moses to be up on the mountain with God. God is instructing Moses about the future of God's people, what their lives are going to be like together, but he's got to go back down the mountain. What does he find when he gets back down the mountain? What will Jesus find when he goes down the mountain? A little bit of chaos. There's a lot of similarities between these two stories. When they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what had seen. Now you know Peter, James, and John won't tell. I know what Jesus has been saying, but look what we saw. Jesus tells them, just like He's told everybody else, don't tell anybody. That Messianic secret is, is a theme throughout Mark's Gospel. Don't tell anybody until after the Son of Man has risen from the dead. So they kept the matters to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead could mean. Now, they know about resurrection. In, in um, Jesus' day, from the intertestimonial period onward, the Pharisees are the champions of the idea of resurrection. In the last days, God will raise all of those who have died for judgment. So they understand what resurrection is, but what does it mean for the Son of Man to be raised from the dead? They don't understand what Jesus is talking about. Then they asked Him, What do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And he said to them, Elijah is indeed coming first to restore all things. How then is it first to restore all things? How is it, is it written about the Son of Man that he is to go through many sufferings and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come and they did to him whatever they pleased as is written about him. So as they are walking down the mountain, they're thinking about all they saw they're questioning what Jesus says, and they saw Elijah. And in their day, um, many people think that Elijah is supposed to come back at the end. I'm going to read a couple of, of passages from um, extra-biblical sources that would have been familiar with some of the mindset of Jesus' day. Uh, from Sirach, uh, at the appointed time it is written, Elijah is destined to calm the wrath of God before it before it breaks out into fury, to turn the hearts of uh, parents to their children and restore the tribes of Jacob. Um, from another uh, source, uh, one of the rabbis wrote, I have received as a tradition from Rabbi so-and-so, um, given to Moses from Sinai, that Elijah will not come to declare unclean or clean, or to remove afar, or to bring nigh, but to remove afar those that were brought nigh by violence and to bring nigh those families that are removed by violence. Uh, another says, And the resurrection of the dead shall come through Elijah of blessed memory. And another source, the Sibylline oracles say, uh, Elijah the Tishabite, driving a heavenly chariot at full stretch from heaven, will come on earth and then display these signs to the whole world as life perishes. And there's others that wrote about that. And the, and the reality is they've heard stories that Elijah's supposed to come at the end before resurrection. Jesus has mentioned resurrection. They've seen Elijah. So what does this mean that Elijah's supposed to come first, Jesus? And Jesus says, How then is it written about the Son of Man that he is to go through many sufferings and be treated with contempt? But I tell you, Elijah has come. What do you mean? He has come. What do you mean that he has... Um, and they did to him whatever they pleased and is written about him. What Jesus is saying is that 
Elijah has come in the form of John the Baptist. And what was John the Baptist doing? Preaching repentance. And what did they do to him? Kill him. Killed him. And Jesus stands in his footsteps as not Elijah, but Elisha. And what do you think they're going to do to him? To the mantle of Elijah, the prophet had been taken up by John the Baptist and he was killed. And Jesus has been already telling his disciples it's going to happen again. And when they came to the disciples, so they finally come down the mountain, they saw a great crowd around them and some scribes arguing with them. So just imagine you see your disciples after you've had this experience. Other disciples are asking questions. You see your disciples in a group of scribes arguing. It's chaotic, just like Moses coming down the mountain. What are they arguing about? When the whole crowd saw him, they were immediately overcome with awe, and they ran forward to meet him, just like when Moses comes down the mountain. People can't even look at him. He asked them, what are you arguing about with them? Now notice who answers, someone from the crowd. Answered him, teacher, I brought my son. He has a spirit that makes him unable to speak. And wherever it seizes him, it dashes him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth, and he becomes rigid. And I asked your disciples to cast it out, but they could not do so. Now we've been reading Mark's Gospel, and we know Jesus has commissioned His disciples to go out and do what? Heal and exercise demons. And what have they been doing? They've been doing it. Somebody has brought his son to the disciples and they couldn't do what they've already been doing. And he answered them, you faithless generation. How much longer must I be among you? How much longer must I put up with you? Bring him to me. Sounds a whole lot like Moses when he comes down the mountain, don't it? Frustrated. We can only imagine the disciples have tried and tried and tried with this child. Doing everything they've done before. And nothing worked. And Jesus comes down, he's had this mountaintop experience. And he gets frustrated. Mark shows us frustration in Jesus. You faithless generation. How much longer must I be among you? I'd hate for Jesus to show up to me. <laughs> Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when the Spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy and fell on the ground and rolled about foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked the father, how long has this been happening to him? Notice Jesus asked some good questions. It's like a doctor. How long has this been happening? From childhood, it has often cast him into the fire, into the water to destroy him. But if you are able to do anything, have pity on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you are able, all things can be done for the one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out, I believe, help my unbelief. If you go back to Mark chapter 5, uh, verse 36. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader, Jairus' house, to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow except Peter, James, and John. So that same three was with Jesus Saw this happen. Jesus says, do not fear, but what? Believe. This man says, I believe, but what? Help my unbelief. I wouldn't be here if I didn't believe Jesus. But help my unbelief. I often tell people, 
on a good day. It's between us and whoever's watching online. <laughs> on a good day, uh, if I had to have like a gauge of my belief and faith versus my doubt. And doubt's not a bad thing. Okay? On a good day, it's above the 50%. On a bad day, it might be below the 50%. One of the things I've realized in life is a mustard seed amount of faith is sometimes all you need. But there are times in our lives when we come to Jesus and we have to say the very same thing. I believe, but you're going to have to help me in my unbelief. Because guess what? My son has not only been suffering, but he constantly is in danger all the time. I mean, the demon, the possession is causing him to be cast in the fire and the water to destroy him. Imagine being a father who can never rest knowing that your child is safe and secure. I believe because I'm here, but hell my unbelief. Because eventually, guess what's going to happen to my child? It's going to die. There's points in our lives where we have to be honest enough with Jesus to say, yes, I believe, but there's parts of my life that don't. It's not 100% all the time. If there's somebody that's got 100% faith all the time, you let them, I'd love to talk to them. Help me with my unbelief. When Jesus saw the crowd running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You spirit that keeps this boy from speaking and hearing, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. After crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out, and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, He is dead. Just like Jairus' daughter, what? He's dead, don't worry about coming. The crowd sees the boy as dead. And what did Jesus say to Jairus? She's but asleep. This boy probably died. The fear of the father comes true. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he was able to stand. He goes and enters a house, and his disciples ask him privately. You've got to imagine those disciples have been standing on the sideline. They did everything they thought they could do. They got in an argument. This man's upset. Jesus shows up, is able to perform the miracle that they couldn't. And they're questioning, why could we not do it? And he said to them, this kind can only come out can only come out only through prayer. I want us to think about sometimes when we've been in our journey of faith, and uh, we've been doing it a while. And it looks like we're doing it pretty good. Sometimes we can think of it individually. Sometimes we can think about it even as maybe a group, a church. And you look at what you've done in the past and you say, well, I've done it in the past, I can do it again. And Jesus says it only can happen if you fully rely on what? On God. Just because you did it before, don't get the idea that it was you to begin with. <coughs> It can only come through prayer. It can only come through God's intervention. And one of the things that we see throughout the, uh, the book of Acts, and, and we see it uh, several places in Acts, is there are people that are willing to what? Pay the disciples for what they're doing. Or if you can teach me how to do it, I'll pay you to do that. Or if you can give me access to the Holy Spirit, I'll pay you for that too. And part of the problem, even in church life, is sometimes we think it's what we've done that's made the impact. 
And Jesus looks at them because they're down there trying their best to do what Jesus has asked them to do, but they've forgotten where the source was. Just the same as um, Jesus, uh, Moses comes down the mountain and sees those worshiping the idols, what happens very quickly with them? They get amnesia. They forget the source of their liberation and their joy and their hope. We can only imagine the early audience reading Mark needing a refresher that sometimes they need the very words of Jesus in their lives again and again and again. They went on from there and passed through Galilee. Now what you'll notice is that Jesus, as he moves from here onward, if you were to take a map of where Jesus is going, his journey is leading towards Jerusalem. So far, if you go through the, the Gospels and track Jesus' movement, he's going to different places, and he comes back to Capernaum and to Galilee and the Sea of Galilee. But this movement is going to be on his way um, towards Jerusalem. They went on from there, and he did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is about to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying, and they were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in his house, in the house, they asked them, What are you arguing about on the way? What's the way? The way towards Jerusalem. But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another who was the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. So the question comes up as they are following Jesus. After Jesus has already told them in chapter 8 um, what it means to lose your life to save it, um, they don't understand what this kingdom of God looks like. They're asking, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? Reminds me of a bunch of little boys talking about who's the best ball player or wrestler or whatever it is. Who's the greatest? Bruno, you've had, the, you've had kids around. You hear that, don't you? Who's better at what? All the time. All the time. And we can only imagine them just... Jesus happens to be in earshot as they're talking about it. And they're arguing about it. Whoever wants to be the first must be last of all and servant of all. And then he took a little child and put it among them. And taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such as a child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. Now in Jesus' day, servants and children were pretty much on par. Now we have a culture that puts children way up here. There's nothing wrong with that. I got a child. But in Jesus' day, children were not thought of as highly as we think of them in Jesus' culture. Now, beginning in, in Hellenistic and Roman culture, they started to be viewed differently. Romans would often talk about children as little, little adults and, and would treat them sometimes as little adults. But Jewish culture in Jesus' day did not think of it that way. Um... I'm going to read a, a, a clip from one of our sources here. Uh, it says, Ancient Judaism seems to have had little regard for the individuality of a child. Children were generally thought to be self-willed, lacking in understanding, and need of stern discipline. The same might be said of Greco-Roman society, except with Hellenism, one can trace a rising res regard for the place of children. Both the art and literature of the period attest. Rabbis, in particular, did not associate with children. Rabbi Das ben Hakarides wrote, Morning sleep, midday wine, chattering with children, and tearing in places where men of the common people assemble destroy a man. So he likens hanging out with children is as bad as overindulging in wine, Hanging out with common folk and being in places you shouldn't be. 
that don't move in Scarborough. No. That's right. <laughs> Another said, since the, since the day the temple was destroyed, poppy has been taken from the prophets and given to fools and children. So children in Jesus' day and, and during that society were not viewed as a rabbi, the teacher, should not associate with children. It's a waste of time. Now we would view that differently. You know, we, we see pictures of Jesus holding the little children we, we, we think of it as, oh, that's sweet. I often send out a card. Mary, I'm sorry I didn't send you this one. But if I, occasionally if I find one, it's got Jesus on the, I shouldn't, it, it's not, it's, it's, it's funny. So <laughs> It's got Jesus on the cover and he's got the little kids and he's loving the kids. And it says, on the cover it says, Jesus loves the children. And you open it up and he says, he must love old people too or something. Because like <laughs> you're old. I know. <laughs> but in Jesus' day, this is obscene. Jesus picking up a child and saying, if you want to be great in the kingdom, if you want to be first, you must be a servant to all. He takes a little child, puts him on them. Whoever welcomes one such as this child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me and whoever does not welcome me, whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. Can you imagine? You know, for us, I don't know what the equivalency of that would be. You know, we don't have servants, and we view children as wonderful. Our culture, it might be one who welcomes an older person. Because in our culture, let's just be honest, senior adults aren't necessarily valued. I mean, you look at whether it's at a certain age, you can't get a job. Or how we oftentimes, as much as we try, we don't take care of our seniors the way our culture should. I see in the younger generation throwing shade on uh, the baby boomer mm -hmm. generation. Okay. Call them, you know, boomers. Oh, you know, but, you know whatever boomer. You know. Yeah. I, I hear that a lot. I yeah. see it written a lot. And there are some in our culture that put a lot of that on younger people, too. And true. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, it's one of those, you know, but for Jesus' day, for an adult man to hang out with a child just was not. Man, yeah, <laughs> that's a different story. Different story. But I mean, you know, even a father just hanging out with his child and their friends. I mean, it just wasn't something you did. And Jesus says, anyone that welcomes somebody like this child welcomes me. Not only welcomes me, but the one that sent me. Jesus is showing his disciples the kingdom of God is not meant for the great people. Luke will say it in such a way is that, you know, those people you think are great, those Gentiles that have titles, they're kings, princes, what do they do to you? They beat you down. Great people what? They mistreat those under them. It's not to be that way with you, Jesus says to him. Jesus says, the least are the great and the great are the least. And John said to him, teacher, we saw someone casting out. Notice how he changes the subject. It's always good to notice how they change the subject. Jesus, we saw someone, uh, teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, do not stop him, for the one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterwards to speak. Would they be able to speak? Whoever is not against us is for us. For truly I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. So Jesus looks and says, if someone is out there doing something in my name, don't stop them. Just because they're not a part of our little group here? That's a good word for churches. 
and denominations. If they're out doing the thing in Jesus' name, but they're not a part of your group, don't stop them. And he says, if anyone puts a stumbling block before one of these little ones, so Jesus goes back to the children, the least of these, Mark Matthew would call them. If anyone put a stumbling block in front of someone who is small or not mature or servant, It would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and thrown into the sea. Now, if you, I don't have a picture, but if you think of a millstone, millstones were huge. So this is hyperbole. Heavy. Very heavy. Nobody's going to pick it up and throw it into the sea. But Jesus says in that hyperbole, it would be better for you if it was rung around your neck and you were thrown in the sea. What would happen? You're just going to sink. It'd be better if you were what? Cast away into the depths of the ocean without any chance of coming back than to make one of these stumble. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go to Gehenna, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and thrown into Gehenna. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into Gehenna, where the worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good. But if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in your lives and be at peace with one another. Very quickly, we'll end um, chapter 9 by looking at what Jesus is saying. So Jesus says, it would be better for you to have a millstone than to what? Put a stumbling block in someone reaching me. That's a good word for churches. It's a good word for Christians. It's a good word for all of us. You know, think about Jesus' day. Jesus is living in a world, and the early church will live in a world where there's going to be a question, how do you get to Jesus? Peter and Paul will have to deal with that question when it comes to the Gentiles. Are we going to make them be like us in terms of the law, the covenant, circumcision, dietary regulation, are they going to have to live up to the same standards of the Hebraic law as we are? Or are they going to be able to come in differently? Now, I'm just going to be honest with you. If you're a Gentile man living in the ancient world, if you're a man today living in today's world, and somebody told you you're going to have to change your diet, you're going to have to have some elective surgery, and you'll have to do things completely different than you've ever done them before. And only then, after you've completed all of that prerequisite, can you come and follow Jesus. You think you would do that? So Mark is writing to the early church as much as Jesus is saying it to his disciples, saying you can put stumbling blocks before somebody. You know, think about Jesus is here and you're here and you're going to go from here to here to Jesus but you've got an obstacle course to get there. At what point are you going to stop and turn around? And Jesus says, don't put stumbling blocks in front of people to come to me. The churches don't do that, do they? Once had a pastor uh, tell me about a story, and, and I won't go into detail, but they had somebody in their church that was wanting to come down to be baptized. Weren't necessarily wanting to do anything other than that. They wanted to give their heart to Jesus. Well, the, some things in their life, many people thought, precluded them from doing that. You can make up whatever you want. It could be anything. They came to the pastor, and they had money, and they said, Pastor, we don't want them coming down. He said, what do you mean you don't want them to come down? 
He said, we don't want them to come down. We don't want them to come and give their life to Jesus at our church. You need to tell them to go somewhere else and do it. He says, you don't want them to join the church? No, don't want them to join the church. You don't want them to be Baptist? Not here. And he said to them, well, I can't keep anybody away from Jesus. No matter who they are or what they do, it's not my job to keep them away. It's my job to bring them to and he says, you can leave and you can give all your money to somebody else, but we're not going to keep somebody coming from Jesus. Because you don't have to change to come to Jesus. Jesus changes you. Here Jesus is telling his disciples and he's telling that early church, don't put stumbling blocks in front of people to make them become something before they meet Jesus. It is up to Jesus and the Spirit to transform those people. It's not up to you. It's not your vocation to change somebody. That takes a lot of work on the individual purpose. It took Peter to change to go to Cornelius' house. And when he went, I'm sure he gagged the whole time. It'd be the same for us to go to somebody's house that we have been taught we shouldn't be in company with. Peter changes, not Cornelius. God meets Cornelius where Cornelius is. And from there he changes. Then he says, if anyone puts a stumbling block for these little... And then he says, if a hand causes you to stumble. So he moves this from the other person back to you. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. Hyperbole. Now you go to Marshall Pickens and other places, they... There are some people that read it and because of one reason or another, they actually cut parts of their bodies off after they've read this. Jesus didn't mean for you to do that. It's hyperbole, just like the millstone. But Jesus is saying, if there is a part of your life that is causing you to stumble from staying with Jesus, part of the idea in the early church was Jesus was called the way. And the way is this idea is that it's a journey. You journey with Jesus. Well, the journey can be long, long. It's a lifelong process. And you can stumble along the way. Now, there are things that all of us have that are obstacles that we don't necessarily have any choice over. If we get sick, somebody in family dies, there's a lot of things we do to trip ourselves up. And Jesus says, if there's something in your life that's tripping you up, it'd be better just to cut it off. Then to what? If your hand calls you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter your life, enter life maimed than to have two hands and go to Gehenna or hell or to the unquenchable fire. So Jesus uses a visual reference that most people in Jesus' world knew. There was a trash pit outside of Jerusalem called Gehenna. And you threw your trash there, but it was a place that the trash always was burning. How many of y'all have a brush... Brush pile. It eventually goes out, doesn't it? What if your landfill was always on fire? And Jesus says it'd be better to throw the hand away and enter into heaven what? Than you to be thrown out into the what? Into the trash dump. If your foot calls you to stump, cut it off. Be better to, to enter life lame than to have two feet and be thrown into the trash. And if your eye calls you to stumble, tear it off. For it is better you enter the kingdom with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into Gehenna, where the worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. We'll pick up there next time we get together as Jesus continues His journey towards Jerusalem and the cross. As He continues to go, He will meet people along the way and be challenged. And he will continue to talk about what the kingdom of God is all about. Let's take a moment and pray together before we dismiss.
Gracious God, we thank you for today and we thank you for the time that we've had and the time that we will have. Lord, we thank you that we can go up the mountain with you during seasons of our lives. And God, we are thankful that you challenge us not to put things in our way and others' way that stumble us. Help us, Lord, to remember that whatever has happened in the past, we need you in our present. We need to connect to you through prayer. And help us to continue to look around and to see those in our community and in our families and in our church who are the little ones. Help us to welcome them in your name. Lord, we love you and we thank you for all that you do for us, in us, and through us. And God, as we go about this week, may our prayer be the same request as a father. Lord, we believe, but help us in our unbelief. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.